Sunday morning to you. Why don't you go ahead and stand? If you need a psalm book, they're right there in the seats. Otherwise, the words are on the screen just over in the glory land. I don't know a greater way to think than to start out with that song this morning. Sing it out on that first verse now. I have a home prepared where the saints abide. Just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side. Just over in the glory land. Just those words as you sing it. What a joyful thought that my Lord I'll see just over in the glory land. And with kindred say there forever be just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory song, but our song book weeds out a couple verses, I don't know for what reason. I threw them on the screen, so if you're going to follow along in your book, you're going to sing something different than we are up here. So you watch the screen, you guys know the tune, and can it be a good old, old Charles Wesley song? Sing it out now on that first verse. And can it be that I should?
keep out. There might be some doctrinal differences that if I looked at, I looked all over the place and I looked at them, I said, I don't see anything that we shouldn't sing this song because I love when we get to that bottom. Think about when you were in sin, before you were saved, I woke the dungeon flamed with light, my chains fell off. You didn't do anything for that. Jesus did it all for you. Sing it out on that the third verse. Sing it like you mean it. Long lie in prison spirit lay that found in sin and nature nigh thine eyes use a quickening ray I woke the dark good song. Amen. That was good stuff. Appreciate that. You guys sang so well this morning and uh, looking forward to a good service today. I want to, uh, before we pray in a moment, I just want to give a couple of reminders. Uh, Lisa does a good job of getting things on the screen. Uh, but this Sunday, this coming Saturday is Operation Go at 10 o'clock a.m. Next Sunday is the last Sunday to sign up for the grandparents' luncheon, okay, which will be the following Sunday, September the 12th. Uh, all grandparents and their families invited to stay and, and eat with us. Be a free meal, but you need to sign up. You pay by signing Signing your name on the dotted line, all right? And uh, tell us how many is going to be with you. And then we got uh, missions conference September 15th through the 19th. Keep that in mind, please. It'll be, it'll be uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday. Three services on Sunday, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. And we're going to have a good time there uh, with our missions conference. Starting on September 26th is the new life group schedule. We got four classes for adults, one for the teens. I'll uh, be going on over there in the, in, the fall, in the rooms over there, so keep that in mind. This week, I'll get more information about that because I want you to choose which class you want to go to. Um, I want you to, whatever class you feel like, you go to that class and you, you learn in that class. So whatever you want to do, you do that, okay? And uh, let's remember to pray, a lot to pray for. Do pray especially today for the couch's daughter. Uh, she's in the hospital uh, with COVID. We'll ask God to meet that special need there. And pray for Afghanistan. Continue to pray for those. Uh, and then pray for, uh, I don't know how to pray for Hurricane Ida. I mean, it is here. Uh, well, it's New Orleans, but pray that they would be spared down there and pray that God would meet that special need. And then pray for others that, uh, that are that with the COVID. Pray for the COVID situation. Uh, it's terrible. I hate it. I'm ready for it to be done. And uh, we'll ask God to meet that special need. And then uh, let's pray and ask God's blessings. Father, we want to thank you this morning uh, that we can be in church. So many things in the world going on. A lot of negativity, a lot of sickness, a lot of death, a lot of despair. And Lord, we just come to you today and ask you to meet every special need. 
And Lord, every request we talked about, we do pray especially for uh, Bob and Joan's daughter right now. Lord, you lift her up. We pray that you allow the treatment she's getting to be successful. I pray, God, you would intervene on her behalf and just do a special work in her life and that you might get all the glory and honor. We do pray for our, uh, our friends in Afghanistan. I pray, God, you'd protect them. I pray, God, you'd especially be with our military who was there and the civilians who were there. And God, would you please uh, do a work in their life. And I pray for our leadership. God, we get the backbone and do what we're supposed to do. And Lord, you bless in a special way there. We do pray for our friends in Louisiana. Uh, thinking about the Kovaches right now, uh, down there where the hurricane is. I pray you'd bless them, protect them. And Lord, I pray that you'd intervene there. And Lord, may your will be done as you protect uh, uh, folks there in, in the Gulf Coast. Take care of them. And Lord, we ask you to bless this service in a special way. We ask your will to be done. Would you speak to us through your word? Would you speak to us through the music? Would you uh, bless uh, in the few moments the handbill choirs they perform for us? May you give them the wisdom, Lord, uh, and, the, and the grace to do a good job. Bless them in a special way. Bless this day. Thank you for all those that have gathered together. And bless uh, those watching by live stream as well. Give us a good service, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat, please. I want to introduce the Handbell Choir. This first song they're going to do in a moment, as you've heard it, it's called Amazing Grace. And they're dedicating this song to Sarah Clary. Amen. She bought these handbells for the church about 20 years ago or so, paid a lot of money, and uh, she loved hearing them play. And we're going to dedicate this first song to Miss Sarah Clary. I know sometimes Bobby watches the services online, so if you're watching Bobby, this is for Miss Clary. Church, this is for Miss Clary. Brother Don. The next number the hand milk wire is going to be doing is the song Immortal Invisible. And this will sound totally different from what you heard in the first song. So listen up.
you just as we transition and jump to different things, what a great job. You could have left the last guy on the end off, but what a great job the handbells uh, do, and Brother Don's been doing it for years and years. I don't know the exact number, but I know when I came here, Brother Don says, well, do you want, I said, you're doing a great job. I don't want to take one more thing. You're doing a great job. You do it, and he has done a superb job, and it shows, and we really do appreciate the church investing the money in the handbells, and then you guys be able to come out. We announced this a couple weeks ago to come on out and uh, be able to listen. And you probably wish you could have had a couple more numbers, but believe it, Brother, Brother Don's got us working hard on new numbers all, all every Sunday night. So, hey, and little plug, Brother Don. Anybody else that wants to be part of this, it's not too difficult. He, may, he pushes us, but it's not too difficult. You can do it. And uh, Sunday nights, just talk to Brother Don. Grab your songbook, 434, 434. I was reminded of this song as we were thinking about Miss Clary. Where the roses never fade. Sing it out on that first verse now. I am going to a city where the trees of gold are laid. special at this time. We chose the song, Glory Be to God, a good old Byron Fox. I say old, maybe because Byron's up in his years a little bit, but Glory Be to God is a great song, great message. You think about the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This brings out the descriptions of those and what they do and how we praise each person of the Trinity of of course, all glory goes back to the Lord Jesus Christ who died for our sins, and you see that in the song as well. I trust you'll appreciate this one.
I can say is, as those last three words, amen. We're going to sing, not glory be to God. We're going to go ahead and open our hymnals as the ushers come down. And go ahead and stand, 255. Praise him, praise him. I can't think of another song to follow that up. Praise him, praise him, our blessed redeemer. Go ahead and sing it out now. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed redeemer. Sing, oh, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor. introduce to you Miss Allison McKay. Raise your hand, Miss Allison. Uh, she's a friend of the Garricks, and she's the one who uh, makes our banners for us and who makes all of our cards for us and our t-shirts and uh, does a good job there at a great price. And I told her this morning, what she does is almost perfect. It's almost perfect. It's a good. So uh, I want to encourage you, if you need some advertising for your business or whatever, see her. She could take care of you. she hook you up. And I'm glad she's here, so welcome her a little bit as we leave a little bit later. Let's bow our heads, please, and let's pray for the offering this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the many blessings you bestow on us each and every day. We thank you that you're on the throne and you are in charge. Lord, we see so many things that are happening in this world that are just not right and we don't understand, but yet we know that you are right there taking care of everything. As we worship today, Lord, let's put the things of the world aside and just focus on you. Be with Brother Matt and other pastors as they stand to break the bread of life for their congregations. Be with us as we go out to get this offering. Help us to use it not only in our community, but throughout the world. Guide us, direct us, and all we think, do, and say, let it be pleasing to you. All these things we have in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.
God who just leaned over to me and says, that song makes you happy. You. That's an exciting song. We come to church, we should be excited, we should be happy. And here's another happy song. We got a new trio. We're going to be blessed by uh, listening to them right before Pastor comes and brings the message to us.
whatever happens on this life, we will see Jesus just as He is. But can I say you, we won't be like we are. We're going to be perfect that day. What a glorious thought. And uh, open your Bible, please, this morning to the book of Job. And Job 19, don't be discouraged because I tell you to turn to the book of Job. Uh, we're going to look at the good part. The good part. We're going to mention the bad part. We're talking about the good part uh, this morning. And you know Job's story. You know it well. You've, you've heard many sermons on Job's story. We're not going to look so much at, at uh, all the, the negativity, but we're going to look at jo Job's attitude. Uh, they say attitude is everything, right? Job's attitude was this. No matter what happens, he understands, he knows that his, that his Redeemer liveth. And we're going to see that in a moment, and I hope you'll be encouraged by that. We're talking about on these Sunday mornings, uh, making uh, profound statements from the Word of God. Two weeks ago, Joseph made a profound statement when he said that God meant it under good. All the bad things happened to, to, uh, to Joseph from his brothers selling him as a slave and before that threatening to kill him. And then uh, in the prison and all what happened there, uh, he, later in life he saw his brothers and says, you all meant all this for bad, but the Lord meant it for good. That's very profound. And then last week we talked about, uh, we talked about in, in the Bible, the pro profound statement how, how um, uh, Joshua said this, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. He told his people, he said this, but you got to choose for yourself. And I was reminded last Sunday, the profound statement is, we have to choose for ourselves who we're going to serve. We could choose to serve the gods of this world, or we could choose to serve Jehovah God. It's profound in that, in that it's kind of hard sometimes to apply. It's hard to apply the truth that God means everything in your life for good. It's hard to apply to your life that, that, uh, that, that you have to choose for yourself who you're going to serve. And this morning's profound statement is going to be extremely hard to apply to our life. We'll find it in the book of Job chapter 19. If you're able to, please stand to your feet as you read just three verses in Job chapter 19. I'm going to read verse number 25 down to verse number 27. Job 19... 25, 26, and 27. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. What a profound statement that Job makes in the first part of verse 25 where he says this. Here's the title of the sermon. I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Father, we trust this morning that we've done uh, pleasing in thy sight with our music, with our worship, and Lord, uh, with our offering. And I pray today, Lord, for the next few moments that you may take the words that are said from your holy word. Let it not be just a sermon. But let it be a message, God, that will encourage us, that will help us. We live in a day and age where many are discouraged, many are distraught, many are saddened, many are angry, many are depressed, many are confused, and some don't know how to think, how to react. Lord, would you help us this morning understand this great truth from your Bible that we can know that our Redeemer liveth. We thank you for the story of Job, all it means to us. Thank you for the... And for the encouragement it's been to many believers for many, many years, and for the next few moments, would you allow it one more time to speak to us and help us in the days ahead? We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat, please. Well, Job is a very interesting character in the Bible, if you will, and we're mostly familiar with all of Job's trials, and we understand that, but we really know a little bit about his Background. We first read about the book of Job with the character of Job uh, early in his life when the, the Bible kind of tells us he lives in the land of us. That's kind of strike one against him. Not Oz, but us. And uh, he's a man, the Bible tells us, that God knows us about him. He walks upright, and the Bible tells us that he fears God and he is she with evil. In other words, he's got the right attitude about evil. And we're told uh, that this man, Job, uh, uh, the first thing to hear about him is that he's fully dedicated to God. That's important because before the trials come, Job is already committed to God. And we often, 
And we do this probably erroneously, but we often consider Job's life and we, and we put all the emphasis on the fact that he, that he suffered so much. And that is a major part of his life. But we need to focus on this morning, uh, not so much the, the beginning of his story where the Bible says he loses all that he loses and, and how that's very, very important. But I don't think that's the most important part about Job's story. And we could take time, we don't. We could look over in Job chapter 42 and read how God blesses once again and Job gets all he had and then some. And so his suffering, while it's important, is not the most important part of his story. And while at the end of verse chapter 42 we read that he got everything back and then some, that's very important, but that's not the most important part about Job's story. I think, as humbly as I know how, I think that the most important part of Job's story is right here in our text. Job chapter 20, uh, 19, verse 25 through verse 27, you, the, 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 the story brings us in this chapter where Job's friends show up. <laughs> I use that term friends loosely. And they come to encourage Job and they say, Job, uh, well, their thought is to encourage Job. And I wonder, maybe Job even thought, well, I'm glad my friends are going to come. They're going to encourage me. They're going to have prayer with me. They're going to, uh, you know, remind me about all the good in life. And, and so Job comes, his miserable com comforters come, and they don't come with a message of encouragement. But they come and they say this to Job. Well, Job, uh, it's obvious to us in all of our wisdom that what you're going through is all your fault. It's all your fault, Job. There must be some sin in your life, Job. So you've got to search your heart, Job, and see why it is God's punishing you. His friends say to him, it's obviously your fault because this God that you claim to serve wouldn't let this stuff happen to you if you were a good person. And so, Job, you have to repent and you have to turn back to God and all of these calamities uh, will just kind of subside. <laughs> That's what they say to Job. And you could take time to read about from chapter about 3 on to here in the middle of the, of the, of the book of his friend's advice to him. But then in chapter 19, Job has some advice for his friends. And he says to them, you know, you come to me with this silly message that I must be in sin because bad things only happen to people who are in sin and that's just a lie from the devil. And here's what Job says. He, he says, you know, I don't really uh, agree with what you're saying and I don't think that my problems in my life are because of my sin. But here's what he says. I do know this. He just says, I do know this, that, uh, that I know my Redeemer liveth and I'm going to see him again. That's what he tells his friends there. They come to comfort him, but he's got a profound statement for them. You know why it's profound? It's hard to fathom. It's hard to fathom the fact that we can know that our Redeemer liveth. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, there's other religions, if you will, other churches, other cults who their God is not alive. He's dead and in, in the grave. And there's other religions and beliefs, if you will, not faith, but beliefs and, and doctrines that say that you become a God. Well, you can't God yourself. You can't redeem yourself. If you're a believer, you've got to know this, what Job knew, that he knew, uh, he knew his Redeemer liveth. Let's look very quickly at our outline this morning. Is your outline on yellow paper? Yeah. Sorry about that. I printed it off, and it was already yellow, and I wasn't going to change it. So, anyways, you'll be able to see it better. All right, you'll be able to see it better. All right, number one, let's notice a few things, four things about, four truths about Job that will help him be able to make this statement. And I hope you can know these same four truths this morning. Number one... Write this down. Uh, Job knew the Redeemer. He knew the Redeemer. You say, well, duh. Well, look what the Bible says. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. It's interesting that as Job's friends come and they probably have good intentions and they probably leave their, their house and they, they meet at the racetrack and they gather together and they all go to uh, Job's house and they say to themselves, well, we're going to talk to Job, we're going to encourage Job, we're going to lift his spirits if you will, we're going to have prayer, we're going uh, uh, to take him some fried chicken and we're really going to do our best to encourage him, but it, it doesn't work. And he goes on to listen to their story and listen to what they have to say and think about what Job lost, his family, his wealth, his health. He lost everything a man could ever have. And you would think that looking at it from human, a human point of view, you would say, well, his life is over. And I have no doubt Job questioned God, not in a bad way. I'm sure Job probably thought, you know, why? When? Why me? Why now? Why this? 
There's a lot of things we don't understand about Job, but we do know one thing. He knew his Redeemer. And Job maybe even have said this out loud to the Lord or to his friends, and he may have even said, I don't know why these are happening to me. I don't know why I lost this and lost that and lost that. I don't know why these things have come upon me. He says, but I do know this. I know my Redeemer. I know my Redeemer. So Job, he knew his Redeemer. And let me say this is going to be not profound at all, but you may think of, you, you may not realize this, but when, when Job says, uh, uh, I know my Redeemer, and this, this, this challenged me, this encouraged me, because I know my Redeemer, but I think as important, if not more important, my Redeemer also knows me. And he knows what we go through. Job, uh, God knew exactly what Job was going through because remember, God allowed it. God, the Redeemer, knows Job. Of course Job knew him, but also the, the Redeemer knew Job. In Job 1.8, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feared God and is true with evil? Here's what, the devil, here's what the Lord says to the devil. I know Job. He's my servant. He fears me. He has the right attitude about sin. Uh, uh, he, he's an upright man. So we understand from Job chapter 1, not only did uh, Job know the Redeemer, but the Redeemer also knows Job. And by the way, Job is unaware that conversation took place between the Lord and the devil. Job had no idea. All Job's doing in, Job, in the first part of Job is Job is just living his life as a dad, as a parent, as a farmer. And this conversation happens, and the, devil, and the Lord says to, to, the, to the devil, I know Job. Let me encourage you this morning. What a blessing it is that you can know the Redeemer, but how much more blessing is it is this? Your Redeemer also knows you. John 10, 14 says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. 2 Timothy 2, 19 reminds us, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Yes, uh, Job knew the Redeemer, but the Redeemer also Knew him. Number two. Number two, everybody okay? All right, good. Number two, Job knew the Redeemer lives. Job knew the Redeemer lives. <laughs> Probably didn't mean much to his friends that the Redeemer lives because I don't think they knew him. Um, they hadn't suffered like Job had suffered. They hadn't gone through anything like Job was going through. And uh, this one profound statement that Job made to his friends, it, it sums up his commitment and his focus to the Lord, uh, even though he's lost everything, and, and there's no way his, he knows where his life could be headed. There's, there's no way to fathom all he's lost, uh, uh, and they didn't lose anything. Job lost everything, and, but at this very moment, he didn't know one thing. He knew that his Redeemer, he knew that his Redeemer, his Redeemer lived. You see, not all so-called Redeemers are alive like Job's was. I think these three friends, their God must not have been alive. Job's hope wasn't in some powerless dead God made with man's hands. Job's hope wasn't in some God carved out of a piece of wood. Job's hope wasn't in some God, some trinket, some idol that was chiseled out of stone. No, Job's hope was in the Lord who lives and lives forevermore. Job knew God. Job served God. Job knew God was omnipotent. He was eternal. He knew this. God's aware of my situation. <laughs> we'll never go through what Job went through. We've all gone through things. We've all faced calamities of life. We've all had terrible news. We've all had bad texts and emails sent to us. We've all had terrible situations we've gone through with family and friends and loved ones and finances and marriages and, and sicknesses and all of that stuff. And we've lost loved ones and, and all of what's happening and, and all of that. But we, and we don't understand why. We don't understand uh, why us, why now, why this. But we can know this, whatever happens in this life, our Redeemer, we can know Him and we can know that He lives. We can know He lives. You've heard this phrase. 
We cannot know what tomorrow may bring, but we can know who holds tomorrow. And you think, well, that's kind of cliche, isn't it? That's kind of like, that's that, that's that token statement you keep memorized. So when your friend comes to you and says, give you some bad news, you can say, well, we don't know about tomorrow, but we know who holds tomorrow. And it's not just cliche. It's not just that token sentence we say to our friends. It's the truth from the Word of God. We don't know what tomorrow brings, but we can know who holds tomorrow, and that's our Redeemer. He, we know Him. He's alive. And we can know Amen. that forevermore. We can have confidence. Job said this, by the way, many, many years before Jesus even came the first time. Some Bible scholars believe Job uh, may have been the very first book written. We don't know for sure. Bible scholars believe Job lived in the time of Abraham, a long time before Christ. We don't know for sure. We do know this. A long time before it happened, Job said this, I know my Redeemer and I know that He lives. <laughs> Let me take just a moment and remind you what your Savior went through for you. Died on the cross. The most horrible death ever. Crucifixion. Crown of thorns. Beaten. Spat upon. Ridiculed. Mocked. Drug his own cross to the streets. People hollering at him and, and spitting on him and his own very friends who would late earlier say Hosanna now are saying crucify him and can remind you he did this not for his own sins. He did this for you. He didn't need to be redeemed. We did. So they buried our Savior. And they buried him in what they call a borrowed tomb. <laughs> you know why it's borrowed? Just need it for three days and three nights. Why pay full price for something you're just going to need three days and three nights? He borrowed somebody else's. He borrowed Joseph of Arimathea's grave. And Job wasn't there. Job didn't have the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to read that Jesus rose from the dead. He didn't have the scriptures to teach us that he would die and live again. He didn't have all of that. How did he know that? He knew it because it was so real to him. He said this, I know my Redeemer and I know he lives and I'm going to see him once again. Look at number three. He knew his Redeemer would come. <laughs> Long before it ever happened, he knew it was going to happen. Amen. He knew his Redeemer he knew his Redeemer lived, and then number three, he knew his Redeemer would come. Look in verse 25, into verse 25. And that he shall stand at the later, latter day upon the earth. Whether Job lived 2,000 years before Christ or 4,000 years before Christ, it could have been four quad, quadrillion years before Christ. And he still had this assurity that, he, yes, his Savior, he could know him. He would die for our sins. He would rise again. He would also come back to receive him. That where he was, he could be also. He knew what the Bible said before there was a Bible. He knew what the Bible said. Job had certainty that God would once again stand upon the earth. And some may say, well, how did Job know? Has Job... What does he know that the other folks don't know? What does Job know that his friends don't know? How could Job make this conclusion? How could Job make this profound statement? How could Job, uh, how could Job have such peace? And how could Job have such a surety? And how could Job be so encouraged by the thought that his Savior would come again? Well, because the Bible says, I know my Redeemer. And when you know your Redeemer, you know He lives, you know He's coming again. He's going to restore that which has been lost. He's going to uh, bring peace where there's no peace. He's going to, the Bible says, make all things new. <laughs> if you've lived more than about 20 minutes, you've experienced some hardship and pain. None of us are going to escape this life adversity-free. None of us are going to have a perfect day every day. Our hope, if our hope was in this life alone, Paul tells us we're of, we're of most, we're, we're miserable. If Job would have listened to the advice of his friends and says, well, I'll be. Maybe I am in sin. Maybe I do need to repent and get right with God. Maybe I do need to do whatever. He would have been so miserable. 
But he said to his friends, I know my Redeemer. I know he lives. And I know he's coming again. John 14, 1 through 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. This is for somebody right now. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus said, You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And Job, uh, uh, 3,000 years before, Jesus even said that he knew it was going to come to pass. He knew his Redeemer. He knew his Redeemer lived. He knew he would come. And finally, number four, he knew the Redeemer gives life after death. Look in 26 and 27. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Job had the assurity as he made this statement some two or three thousand years before Christ made the statement. He knew this statement. He knew this. He says, I know my Lord is going to come again. And after I die, after worms destroy this body, after I'm nothing but a memory on people here on this earth, I'm going to see God once again because he gives life. By the way, he's the only one who gives life after death. And think about this. Is that not the cornerstone of our entire faith? Life after death? Why trust Christ if there's no life after death? Why serve Him with sincerity and truth if there's no life after death? Why waste our time? Why waste our efforts? Why waste our money? Why waste our emotions why waste our service on something if there's no life after death and by the way can I remind you only the Redeemer can give you life after your death Job was no theologian but in this point he was theologically 100% correct let me close I want to read about three little pieces of scripture to you and we'll we'll have prayer 2 Corinthians 5, 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5, 8. For we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 51 through 58 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall raise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, uh, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, O death, where is thy uh, death fall in victory? O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? But the sting of death is sin and strength is the sin of the law but thanks be unto God which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ therefore my beloved brethren be ye steadfast here's what he says unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord Amen. I don't know after Job told that to his friends did he say and put that in your pipe and smoke it some folks can be so discouraging can't they if you watch the news, you're going to be discouraged. If you scroll through too much social media on your phone, you're going to be discouraged. If you watch what's happening around the world, you're going to be discouraged. But the Bible tells us this, we can know for sure who our Redeemer is. And we can let Him give us life after our death. We know He's going to come again. And things on earth, we don't understand all what happens. We don't know why, uh, why things happen to people. We don't know why folks get sick, why people get divorced, why folks lose their incomes, why folks have bad times. We don't know any of that. That's unsure. We have no idea why all that stuff happens. But what, what, what we can know, we can know this. We can know our Redeemer. We can know He lives. We can know He's coming again. And we can know that He gives life. 
after death. Let's bow our heads, please. Father, I don't know where this message finds your people, but I do know this, Lord, that a lot of folks going through some tough times. A lot of folks really struggling. A lot of homes are being hurt. Marriage is being broken up. Loved ones are sick. Weather, politics, military-wise, national security, jobs. A lot of negativity out there, Lord. You know that. But I pray, Lord, uh, that you may allow this, these thoughts from Job, his testimony, his attitude, help us this morning. I pray, God, you may take the words that were said and help them to just speak peace to your people. And maybe today, God, you've spoken to someone's heart about their salvation. Lord, I trust that there'll be somebody here that does not know thee as Savior that gets saved today. Realize the reality of sin. We all sin. We all come short of God's glory. And we cannot save ourselves, but God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, can save us from all of our sin and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Maybe someone needs to come and ask the Lord to save them. Maybe some need to come and pray just for you to work in their life, for you to bless a loved one. Whatever it is, Lord, have you spoken to our hearts and invite your people to come. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. you're saved. If you die today, do you know for sure heaven is your home? Are you as a believer, are you right with the Lord? I want to encourage you, you can know your Redeemer. You can know He lives. You can know He's coming again and you can know He only gives life after death. this morning please I want to thank you for being in church this morning and uh, thanks for watching my live stream by the way today is Dave Brindell's birthday is that right how old is brother Dave old he's old I know he probably watched by live stream he's probably already turned it off by now and uh, but anyways if you can take time to wish brother uh, Dave a happy birthday I think um, Gene Blunt's birthday is Thursday or Friday sometime coming up here, so make sure you reach out to her. Anybody else has got a birthday, reach out. Just give them a text or a call. Have a birthday. Praying for you. And uh, pray for each other. Would you do that, please? And uh, I'll pray for you if you pray for me. And